Hi everyone, good afternoon and welcome to the third day of the Global Innovation Forum. So it's across five days, 120 plus speakers and simultaneous regional events with one goal, to bring the global community to unlock digital ecosystems potentials. So the session is brought to you by Swapcard and please do, we encourage you to use the chat to comment and the QA box and connect with each other directly. Use our hashtag, uh, rediscover innovation to join the conversation. And if you wish to listen into another UN languages, just click on the link below. Remember, you can only ask questions on Swapcard though in English. Also remember that you can vote for your favorite idea on the 2020 ITU innovation challenges. And those, will, those with the most vote will pitch live in front of a jury of high level speakers. So head over to the tab in ITU Innovation Community to browse their pitches. So thank you for joining, creating relationships and pitching stories to media and policy makers. I'm very excited about this session. My name is Sarah and I was one of the ITU challenge winners last year. Today we have Theo and Andrew. And Theo has extensive research in campaigns and comms, uh, campaigns as large as presidential scale. He's currently working at the Resilient Shift and is the founder of Participate Strategies. So we'll be hearing more about what relationships, what should a relationship between startups and policymakers look like. And Andrew is the founding partner of Emerging Europe, the leader of the Tech Emerging Europe Advocates Initiative, and has extensive experience as a journalist. So we'll be learning more about what a relationship between media and startups should look like. So I'll take it away, Sophia. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, can I just confirm you can hear me? All right, we're good to go. So uh, thank you, Sarah. And uh, I just want to say thank you to the ITU for inviting me to be part of today and the whole week, which has had a great program. So I really appreciate it. As Sarah mentioned, my name is Theo Backrack, and uh, I founded the organization Participate, which has now sort of morphed into a, a strategic campaign consultancy where we, we take people who have ideas about civic participation and want to get involved in the policy and decision-making progress. And we help them turn those ideas into concrete actions. So today I am going to run through a presentation on how we can engage with policymakers um, and why we should be engaging with policymakers. And then once we've decided that we want to do that, so what are the practical steps we are going to take to go ahead and do that? So with that, um, let's go on to the next slide because this really sums up why we're here, okay? So on the left, we have how it is. Government in this situation is the distracted boyfriend and they're looking at the same old tired policy ideas and your great innovation startup is frustrated because you have a much smarter idea, but government isn't seeing you. Now let's flip to how we want it. Now we want government to be looking at your innovation thinking, yes, that is what I'm interested in, you know, with our research and development financing, with our policy announcements and which companies we profile. And my hope is, you know, with everything I'm about to say, ultimately we come down back down to this, which is how we can get noticed by government and engage them. So with that, let's move on to the next slide, please. So put simply, why do we want to engage with government and policymakers? As you can see there, Government writes the rules of the game. Um, with government decisions on research and development and funding, they can have significant consequences on the markets that you operate in, the consumer habits and change business models, um, which can uh, significantly impact you, but also present great opportunities for you. So with that, we want to raise uh, your profile so you can be seen by government. We wanna create the right environment for government to be listening to you. Um, but also there's a more sort of civic um, duty and reality, which is the process needs outside voices. So if government and the current policy process were working well, there probably wouldn't be any need uh, for your idea, which can make such a difference. But we need more non-career politicians and government types to be involved with innovative, innovative, innovative ideas that can help tackle the public policy problems which government is dealing with. And if you're thinking, oh, perhaps I don't have time for that, that's not important. Well, if we move on to the next slide, you can see just who is currently engaged with it. So it's time for a brief quiz, I know. Um, so answers in the chat, I'm gonna give you 15 seconds. Of these two figures, um, what is the current amount spent on lobbying per year versus the combined operational budget of both houses of Congress? And it might not surprise you to know that the amount spent on lobbyists in 2019 was 3.49 billion, which um, 
is far bigger than the actual operational budget of Congress itself. So it shows that people are involved in the process as well. And out of the 100 organizations that spend the most on lobbying in developed countries, how many are business interests? The answer is actually 95. And if you're thinking it's 99, the, um, the truth is that both those answers are far too high, but it is a 95. That's how many um, big business interests are already lobbying government, which could have a real impact on you. And if you're thinking, what can government do for me? Well, let's look at the research and development budget of the EU. Of 2018, it was 377 billion, which is the answer to this. Whereas um, the research and development budget of Amazon, as you can see here, was, 30, uh, was just 23 billion. So there's significant funding which government puts into research and development. And some of the biggest companies in the world have come from engaging with government at the start and getting research into their work. So we've decided we're gonna do it. So let's go on to the next slide, which is about how we go ahead and participate, engage and influence government. So the goal here is to make ourselves heard within the system and then make things happen. But we can only do this when we know why we want to engage. And that's a really important question you need to have sorted at the start. So why are you looking to engage with government? Is it to raise your profile? Is it because there's an issue which is affecting your company or your community that you want to speak to government on? Or is it because you want to position yourself as a market leader with a view to applying for funding when there's a tender process with a public policy problem that government is going to an outside source on? Whatever the answer to that is, congratulations, you're now a lobbyist. And if you're thinking, lobbyist, shudder, I feel disgusting, don't worry. Lobbying is the second oldest um, profession in the world, probably. And in truth, all it is is about persuading people who hold power to care about your issue and your company. And again, if you think that's not something I do, other people are already doing it. And you can only influence change when you're in the arena and when you participate. Fortunately, at the moment, it is simultaneously easier and harder than ever before to engage with government because there isn't the separation of needing to go to a you know, faceless government building to engage. You don't have to physically travel anywhere. But of course, there's much more uh, with digital platforms. There is a much um, bigger audience out there who's also trying to engage government as well. So we need to be really strategic with how we do it. And finally, just back yourself when it comes to engaging with decision makers. Even if you're thinking, you know, you know they're chalk, I'm cheese, which is a phrase that probably hasn't translated well, but the point is we think we're complete opposite foes. You're not, we really need to engage. And you, if you have, um, if you've had the capacity to come up with the great ideas you have, you're gonna be very well prepared and well equipped to engage government. Of course, if you have the resources, sure you can join an association, pay a big PR firm or simply buy influence. You actually should not just buy influence because with simple engagement strategies, you can be heard by the decision makers who have most impact over you. So let's go and see how we're gonna go ahead and do that. So if we go to the next slide, so we need to start off with doing your homework. It can be really intimidating to go up um, against bigger interests than your own, but the methods that the big players are already using are not complicated. And as I said, if you're an entrepreneur who's taken the risk and shown the drive to set up their own venture or, let, or left the security of a big government organization wow. because you know you have an idea or a product that is better, trust me, you should feel empowered that you'll be heard. At the heart of, the, of what makes you successful is your belief in your own potential, but also the homework and research you do. So for this, we really need to be equipping ourselves with the facts, figures, and data um, around your company or your issue or why you want to be heard by government. So if your issue is that a government policy is creating too much of a burden on your ability to take your product to market, well, let's create some data around why that is. If your issue is that you would like to position yourself as a market leader on a certain public policy program, then we really need to create data around how you are uniquely equipped to solve that issue and what your solution is. And if you think, how on earth am I gonna do that with the limited time I have? I'm a small company, I don't have that many resources. Well, you can reach out to pro bono organizations who are equipped to help folks, especially those of you who are looking to engage with government with a more social impact mindset. The next thing you wanna do after you've done your amazing research is 
we want to create a power map. So we want to map our stakeholders and influencers. So let's go to the next slide and we'll run on through how to do that. So this is a basic power map. And as you can see, it's quite rudimental, but this is actually a really helpful exercise, which is going to visualize who holds power on the imp uh, who holds power over your company and who holds influence over the things you're looking to influence. So we need to decide who we're going to target. If you make a list of your stakeholders, you can work out who has influence over um, your company or your issue, but then also potentially who you could potentially build a coalition with. It's really important that you map out potential partners as well, which we'll see going forward. Because the more people you have, the larger voice you can, you can claim to be speaking with, the more likelihood that you'll be heard. So what we're thinking here is, okay, so we know that government exists as this big monolith, but where do we even start with that? Well, it's important to think about what tier and level of government um, has influence over your company and where you want to engage. It could be you know, the elected politician, the career civil servant. In many countries, it's political appointees. It really depends on who you're trying to engage and what you're trying to achieve by engaging them as to who you go. But what's really key is that you identify the right members of either the parliament, the institution, the government committee. These are the people with the power to initiate, um, support or oppose you. And one thing you also wanna do is look at who would oppose you. So if you have a company, you wanna know who your rivals are, you want to know the people who might oppose the position you're advocating for. But as you'll see here on the map, if there's someone who opposes change but has less power and influence, you don't need to worry about it. Um, see them, but move on. We only want to focus on the people who have the largest amount of influence over your company or the issue you care about. So with that, let's go to the next slide. So with that, this is a, a quick case study which we put together, which was a forensic startup based in the UK, they're actually based in Scotland. So what did we do here? So their goal was to raise their profile and guide decision-making on online security issues, which is what their company's products um, worked in. So they had services, products, and online safety, and government, of course, oversees online safety legislation, regulations, so they want to engage with government on that issue. So step one, what do we do? Well, let's decide to map out the civil servants and policymakers on those issues. Who's on the committee speaking about this issue? Who are the civil servants and departments who are creating policy recommendations as part of the policy process? Let's understand their jobs, what they care about, and what constraints they will have on their work. After we've done that, so let's create some purposeful engagement with them so we can demonstrate our credibility as a company to them and why they should listen to us. One thing that we decided to do was create a round table where we invited the stakeholders we identified, and we can do this online. We don't even have to do it. Um, we don't even have to consider um, a physical meeting space anymore. So it's a real advantage. So we hold this round table where we, the company, are gonna position ourselves at the heart of the debate and demonstrate our credibility um, in front of the stakeholders that we're looking to um, engage with and influence. So that way, when they leave and go ahead and think about their policy issue, they have our company in mind when, when they think, who can we speak to on this? And it's really key that you engage government on policy processes or, initi or initiatives they are already engaging in. Whilst you can go to government um, cold, so on something they're not focusing on, if you can hook what you want to talk about on an issue they're already discussing, you have a much better chance of being heard. So after that, so we've done the meeting, we've demonstrated we're credible, we've shown our expertise and what our company does. Let's create some um, takeaways which keeps the process going. In this, in this case, we decided that there needed to be an organization and it, it turned into an association of companies led by us who could work on online safety, producing content which would inform the policymakers' work. Thus, we've created a direct connection with policymakers on the issue they care about and we want to field ourselves as experts on. As a result, the government can then go public and say, we're working on this issue, we're tackling a policy problem, and look who we're bringing on board. It's a domestic company um, to demonstrate that they're um, engaging and supporting local business themselves. And finally, amplify your good work. If you've done a great engagement, Make sure people know about it. 
there can be many tiers of government who will be interested on this issue. And once you've engaged with one, it's really easy to go and say, I'm speaking to this, I'm speaking to these guys, this is how our expertise has helped them. What can we do to help you? And it's a much easier way to bridge and loop between one entity and another entity who all have influence and can be beneficial um, to your company. So uh, I put media on there, but I'm not going to touch that because Andrew is going to um, lead you through a great presentation on that as well. So that's a brief case study on the steps that you can go through. But now let's decide how we're going to engage and with what language. So let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, great. Speaking the language of your audience. Now, when messaging a decision maker and a policy maker, we need to have detailed fact-based and more substantial um, information than say, if you're going to the public where the language just needs to be really clear and understood. You also need to think about the value proposition and what you communicate being different to what you might um, pitch to someone in the private sector as well. So it goes about saying the government has very different KPIs to a company they're really looking to tackle a public policy problem um, and get value for money, but that isn't their number one issue. So how are we gonna do that? Well, this is one thing that government loves, it's one pages. So we're gonna create all the research that we've done previously, we're gonna bring that to this one pager and we're gonna condense everything down to um, be read by some very busy eyes, which can help kick off the process when we seek to engage with them in person. So what's that one page going to have on it? Well, we're going to discuss what, um, what our company does and what issues we look to uh, tackle. Give a story or a quote to something that can give it a bit more of a human edge. And then we're going to talk about who our coalitions and partners are. So these allies and stakeholders that we've engaged with, let's include them as well so we can demonstrate that we're speaking for more than just one organization. And then we think, so what level of government what level of government can address the issue that we are bringing to them? And then after that, once you've identified what level, okay, what pros do we have to solve them? And why your solution will work? If there's a precedent of the solution uh, you are bringing to government that worked elsewhere, this is the time to highlight that. Because if government thinks, okay, it's worked elsewhere, it's much easier to take that conversation into how it can work for them as well. And no matter how you know, brilliant your company ideas or innovations, you need to demonstrate um, why the decision maker and the policy maker should support. And then that comes down to the evidence that you bring. If you're thinking hard facts, figure, data, that doesn't exactly sound like what I've heard from government in 2020. I agree, but let's try and work towards the world as it should be and not just stick with how it is now. So with that, we are going to go on to the next slide about when we get involved in the process. So again, this is a very crude process about the uh, public policy process and when you should engage. It goes without saying, the earlier you engage, the better chance you have of being heard. In particular, what you can do is monitor public announcements as they come out. And if you hear an announcement on something your company works on, engage there and then and identify who is handling that. So if you have a department of research and innovation and business, and they announce that they are doing a study on X issue, which your company works on, and that's the time that we engage. Because the further it goes down this process, the less likely you are to be heard and have influence on the issue. So with that, we decided we're gonna engage. We're gonna decide, we've decided when we're gonna engage. Let's think about how we can actually go ahead and make that engagement and what that engagement will look like. So if we go to the next slide, please. So communicating in person. So we've decided we want to engage. We've got all of our research and now we're actually going to go ahead and make the leap and get into the arena and engage with decision makers. Firstly, you've got to make the first move. Public officials will be keen to meet as you can give them useful information or ideas Good officials know that they can benefit from outside counsel. And you should also feel confident because at this point, you've got your research, you have your allies, you've got your fact sheet, you know the language they want to use, and you have that coalition behind you. So just approach it like it would be an actual meeting and think about what information you want to provide before the meeting and what you want to bring when you get there. And remember this, government wants to be seen to be supportive. Most governments, 
most governments want to see, want to demonstrate that they're trying to be innovative and support startups and burgeoning industries. So tell them what they'll get. Tell them what they'll get when they engage with you and why what you do matters to them. Ultimately, government is kind of another form of customer that you're marketing to. But it's important to remember all these things here. Demonstrate you're familiar with them. This is a really big secret in um, government engagement, but politicians have egos. I'm gonna let that sink in for a second because I know it can be very shocking. But if you can demonstrate you know them, you demonstrate you know their constituency, their background, what they've been working on, and present your solution as a win for them, it will really help your chances of them saying, we like that idea, we like what your company does, let's run with it. On the flip side though, don't be dismayed if the person you want to speak to has a blank, blank expression and looks like you're speaking another language. The people around them are often the ones that matter most. Their advisors, the civil servants, they're the people who actually do the mechanical work of keeping the process going. And they're the ones you're most likely to be keeping in touch with. And so finally, I think we're going to the last slide. After you've done it, monitor your progress. You've done all this work, but you're actually just at the start, the end of phase one. This is just the start. You need to keep engaging. Think about that case study. You carve out a special role for yourself as an expert or an issue, or as someone who has a particular innovative idea which government can use. Keep on monitoring their policy announcements and track the process as it goes. And if there's anything which is steering away from what you think is best practice, jump back in and re-engage. Offer opportunities for them to profile your work and engage with your sector. Invite them online, probably, but invite them to see your work and offer up a case study that they can use when communicating with the public. And finally, if there's a government um, process taking place around an issue your company cares about, well, offer to testify in front of a government committee. Really put yourself out there. You would be surprised as how few people think that that is a valuable part of the process. And with that, that's basically a crash course on how you engage with government. And I'm going to hand it back over to Sarah. Hi, thank you so much, Theo. That was incredibly insightful and very useful practical tips there. I'm looking at the chat and I see that we have a few questions. So first of all, startups do not have time. Do you have an example of small startup lobbying government successfully? Yes, that is a great question. And here's what I would do to that. Here's what I would say to that. If you are crunched for resources, and I totally get it, you could join an association of startups or put yourself as part of a bigger organization. But the person I would recommend going to on day one is your local representative. They will be really keen to hear about business in their constituency that they can profile and they can give you a quick platform and a quick, um, they can amplify your business quickly to a government network. So if you're crunched for time, Yes, this whole process would require resources behind it, but think about when you map um, who you can go to first without the need of a bigger introduction. And that will often be your local representative. Now, if you don't feel that you can communicate with your local representative, then I would recommend the first step be map out who has influence and pick the person that you think you can best communicate with and go to them first. Thank you, Theo. We have another question. So what currency could you use besides money to lobby in government? Great question. And um, ideas is a great currency. And if you're rolling your eyes, I totally get it. But governments are looking to engage with people who can, tackle the pro who can help them tackle the problems they have. So when I mentioned that um, forensics company, it was about tackling online harm. Now, if your company already does something that government is looking to do, that can be your currency. So your ideas and the fact that you're already doing something they want to be doing, you can take that to them without needing to, you know, spend crazy money on dinners and in, you know joining a party or anything like that. Your great currency would be the ideas because that's the currency which, in an ideal world, should be what government are looking to do. And also by demonstrating the fact that you have the expertise which can assist their process, it makes it much easier to be heard. Thank you. I love that idea as currency. Uh, we have a question from Linda. So it's really difficult to get the chance to meet um, policymakers in person. Is there 
any other alternative to get to know their way, way, of, way of thinking or to get to communicate with them. Yes, there is. Now, this can range literally from everything from working out what the generic government email address is to looking at announcements and who's on them. So from my experience, and this is predominantly in the US, UK and EU, so granted, um, but I think this should be a sort of a generic process enough to be applicable elsewhere. Um, often think about um, if you have a principal, so you have a head of department, who are the, who are the people who are uh, responsible for the operational process of the teams and departments they run, try and engage with them. And when you do seek to engage them, just have a really clear um, reason as to why you're engaging with them. In the most recent um, coronavirus um, task force here in the UK, the inbox of government was flooded with companies looking to offer a solution to them. But you need to just think about a great example that you can have up top as to what you do and why they will be interested in it for the work that they do. I hope that helped answer the question. Thank you, we have a few more coming in. So how do you get the civil servants engaged that those do, so those that do mechanical work and keep the system going? So yeah. how do you engage civil servants? Firstly, do don't quote me on mechanical work. They do very important work and we're all deeply grateful for it. But in my experience, the best way to engage civil servants is they are very busy, um, you know, busy, overstretched. And the best way to do it is to present your engagement as a way of helping the process that they work on. So if they're overseeing, um, if they're overseeing a public consultation on research, research and development funding for a certain industry, well, you can go to them with your facts, your figures, and your practical experience of the issue they're working on. Because the one thing that... Um, infamously civil servants and follow and the decision makers don't have a lot of is the practical experience which you as a company will have that's incredibly valuable thank you Thea. last question that we'll take and then we'll move on to andrew so thank you for your framework do you have any other frameworks you can recommend when engaging with government yeah i, I really do um there is so i'm a part of an organization it's called the good lobby and um, they have a really useful framework, um, which is kind of like a 10 step process about mm -hmm. engagement with government. Um, and that is very helpful. So I think if you just go into the good lobby, you can find the links from there. Uh, and there are also pro bono lobby organizations that exist in multiple countries around the world. Um, I wish I could do now, but I'd be happy to either put them in the chat or people can follow up with me on LinkedIn afterwards and I'll, I can send you that. Um, but there are some really easy step-by-step um, um, -step frameworks which people can use to engage with government. And I can uh, post them in the chat after this. Thank you, sorry, I see one more question that just came in. Uh, we always try to digitally execute what you say, um, but it's always difficult to keep continu continuity and participation of industries. Do you have any ideas that can help continue interact naturally and sustainably ecosystem that can help continue interacting in a naturally and sustainably ecosystem? That is a great question for which my mind is currently ill-prepared to answer. But uh, yeah, so if you're thinking about digital engagement, um, which is for many of us the only um, tool we have at the moment. So let's try and maximize the engagement we have. And one of the ways that I think you can do that is creating your own policy dialogue. So create, uh, bring as many people together at one time. So that way you don't have to go around multiple stakeholders. If you create a policy dialogue, invite everyone to be together at the same time, it's both literally less energy intensive and both mentally um, less energy intensive as well. So that way you can sort of um, do the most with the least. Well, thank you so much, Thea. Thank you for your time and for answering all the questions and for everyone else for answering, for asking the questions in the chat. So we're going to move on to Andrew. And if you missed the introduction, Andrew is the founding partner of Emerging Europe, a London-based hybrid platform, so intelligence, news, and community, and has extensive experience as a journalist. So Andrew will be talking about what a real relationship between media and startups should look like, how to prepare a press kit and a press release. So Andrew, if you want to take it away. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, yes, it's been almost two decades that I've worked as a journalist, so it's been quite a while. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting and having me over. 
Uh, can we start the presentation, please? Perfect. All right, so can we instantly move to slide two? Uh, um, uh, I want to walk you through four sort of points that I want to focus on. So the first one will be related to uh, the strategy, uh, relationship building. Then we're going to talk uh, briefly about uh, how to prepare for any types of media engagement. And finally, how to create ready to go content. Uh, so whenever I, we can move to the next slide, please. And uh, whenever I coach startups, uh, there's always uh, a set of questions that I ask them and it's, it's related to why they want to engage with, with media outlets, which media in particular, you know, how they want to approach them and how they understand media relations. So when it comes to the first two questions, they are quite straightforward. So obviously uh, they want to promote their product services. They want to get investors you know, fundraising, uh, it, it might be both on a, on a national or regional or global level. They also uh, know exactly which media outlets uh, they want to engage with. So, you know, Forbes, uh, TechCrunch or uh, Entrepreneur are always on, on the list. But when it, when it comes to, you know, the question about uh, how to approach them and what kind of strategy they have uh, in order to achieve that, this is becoming slightly more uh, difficult and more complicated. It seems that uh, hardly ever there is actually a strategy. And uh, when it comes to media relations and the term itself, how they understand that, it is more related to, or it means more like taking something as opposed to actually, you know, giving and taking um, as a proper relationship uh, should look like. So my, my uh, idea is always to um, explain to them that I'm quite a systematic person, which means that I like systems to, you know, I, I want to know what I want to do, how I want to get there, when. So I would strongly, re, uh, you know, um, advise that all startups try to answer, you know, answer a couple of questions like why they really want to uh, get involved with, uh, with uh, media outlets, what they want to achieve, you know, how, which ones, you know, maybe, maybe they should start with, uh, with, uh, with uh, national media outlets, or maybe, you know, their industry focused uh, media outlets, and then try to treat them as sort of, uh, you know, try to piggyback on these to reach, uh, you know, international audiences, just, um, just to give you an idea here, you know, uh, a lot of journalists go through whatever is out there, uh, you know, in other media outlets, they read it as well, and they oftentimes get uh, inspired by what they see. So once you have been featured in a, a national newspaper, for example, or, a, a, or even a blog, um, there is a high chance of actually being spotted and uh, contacted. So uh, the, the, next, the next point is, you know, which media and uh, why? What I mean by this is that you definitely need to understand the media landscape. Uh, so you unfortunately have to do some research and uh, understand uh, whether this particular media outlet would work for you or not necessarily do they cover specific topics that you are interested in, or again, unnecessarily? Uh, we often, we as a as a publication, as Sarah said, we you know we are a hybrid organization, but as a publication, we get a lot of um, press releases. Uh, the 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 most uh, hilarious example is that you know we are based in the UK, and a lot of. Uh, PR agencies and, 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 and companies think that we also cover the UK. So I would say a third of all the press releases are related to the UK, while we cover 23 countries of Central and Eastern Europe. So in principle, none of these uh, press releases are relevant uh, for us. And uh, finally, the third point here, you know, what you want to offer, because um, you need to understand and you need to know 
uh, what kind of content uh, you want to prepare for them, whether you know it's an event, for example, uh, and uh, you want to uh, be you, can, you want them to become a media partner, for instance, uh, or is it your new product that has been recently launched, new service? Uh, you need to uh, prepare the right way to approach them. And uh, I, I think I'm gonna echo some of the points that uh, Theo made uh, earlier in his presentation. Um, there is a number of uh, ideas that you can use to actually draw the media's, uh, media outlet's attention. And uh, one of them is media partnerships. Uh, you can organize an event and invite, you know, um, media outlets to become a media partner, you know, offering them some sort of moderation, for example, you know, in with bigger with bigger um, media outlets, this is going to be, you know, unfortunately, probably a commercial, um, you know, um, project, but uh, with smaller media outlets, it might actually work uh, on a counter marketing uh, basis. Uh, Theo was also th uh, talking about, you know, uh, gathering uh, statistics, data. I would strongly recommend, I mean, if you are researching a specific uh, area anyway, why not uh, collect uh, that and, and release as a report, for example? It might be a, re a joint project. It might be something that you do on your own and just invite uh, media outlets to, uh, to cover. If it is something interesting, and I'm quite sure it is, uh, I'm more than certain that they will uh, pick up on that. Uh, can we move to the second slide, please? Uh, I've been talking about, briefly, about building relationships and, uh, and also doing research. I think if you want to uh, get involved uh, or, get enga or engage with, with media outlets, uh, I would strongly recommend that you do not do mass emailing. Uh, instead, I, th I would recommend actually targeting uh, more specific journalists. So doing research, uh, checking what, what kind of topics they cover, how often, uh, you know, whether this particular angle uh, would work for them. Uh, perhaps, uh, you know, reach out to them even if you don't have a story or a press release yet and ask them uh, if a particular topic would be something that would be of interest uh, to them. Uh, this kind of brings me to the second point, which is be out there for journalists. And what I mean by this is, you know, uh, journalists very often need commentators, need people who will uh, discuss a specific uh, idea or just offer uh, a comment. Uh, whenever there is something happening, uh, you know, for example, now with COVID, uh, be out there for them, try to offer a comment related to your industry and, uh, uh, and, and, and share it with, with them. They might not pick, uh, pick it up immediately, but maybe once they have noticed that, they will reach out to you uh, later and also be available, prepared and responsive. So whenever you are actually contacted by uh, a journalist, don't wait, don't make them wait, you know, days. Uh, journalists always work on tight deadlines. And if you uh, make them wait, for example, for three, four days, they, they're not gonna wait. Uh, they'll go some, you know, somewhere else. So be available and be responsive. They will definitely appreciate that and they will come back to you whenever uh, they need uh, a similar comment in, uh, in the future. Uh, be prepared, obviously, that is something, um, uh, something that you know, goes without saying. And, and finally, be friendly and respectful and grateful. What I mean by that is that, and, and, and this all always uh, comes out uh, during you know, coaching sessions when I uh, ask uh, startups what they do after they have you know, uh, just had a uh, story published. And they say, oh, we publish it on our social media channels. And, and I ask, and what do you do with the journalists? Do you contact them? And maybe 5% of all startups say, oh yes, we reach out to them and thank them for this article. You know, we, we are all humans and we also want to be appreciated. We also want to make sure that we've done something uh, 
positive that we've helped. So don't be afraid to get in touch with, with them. That will definitely strengthen your relationship with, uh, with the journalist. And uh, again, I will echo something that uh, Theo said earlier about uh, speaking to, uh, to, to journalists. You know, not all of them, this is about this respectful uh, bit, not all of them know all the topics uh, perfectly well or as well as you do. So sometimes if they ask silly questions, try to be respectful, just answer the question as, uh, in a, 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 as you know, uh, clearly as possible in, with uh, as many details as possible. We can move to the next slide, please. All right, uh, this is a very interesting one uh, because uh, a lot of startups actually miss a lot of opportunities here. So uh, again, during a lot of different coaching sessions, I ask uh, startups if they know or if they have something that is called a press kit or a media kit. And again, unfortunately, a vast majority does not have that or just does not know what it actually is. So when it comes to a press kit, it is a ready-made set of um, you know, content, images uh, that you can send out to uh, anyone who is interested or any journalist who is interested in uh, covering your topic or your organization. It might or it should clearly uh, include very high quality uh, images, you know, a, a company blurb and a, short, uh, and a longer description so they can actually use it anytime they need. It might also you, you include video content, which is obviously, you know, uh, increasingly more uh, popular. Definitely logos. It might uh, include case studies and definitely, uh, you know, reports, statistics, be it statistics related to your company, but also uh, related to the industry that you are, uh, that you represent. Uh, a lot of, uh, I will talk about uh, press releases in a, in a second, but I think I cannot stress enough the importance of uh, photographs. And those photographs, and that I would like to emphasize it a couple of times, you definitely need to have uh, very high quality photographs and um, it is related to your team. I mean, those, those um, uh, photographs should present your entire team or at least the ones, the, the, the people who, who speak to uh, journalists. Uh, it should also include, uh, if it's an app, for example, why not show how the app works? You can embed the app into, uh, you know, a, a, a desktop computer or a, uh, a smartphone as well and present these, uh, these um, uh, pictures there as well. Recently, I had a situation that I recorded a podcast with, a, with the CEO of, uh, of um, a startup uh, which is active in the real estate industry. And unfortunately, uh, when I asked them for, a, for a, a picture, they didn't have one. So we had to uh, use a generic picture which is definitely a missed opportunity for, uh, for you. And as you probably are aware, uh, you know, Google search results relies on images. So if someone wants to look you up uh, on the internet, you also uh, give them you know, a higher chance of being uh, found. Uh, the next point uh, focuses on the audience. So we're, we're kind of uh, moving slightly to uh, any type of, of uh, media engagement and uh, you definitely have to need, you have to know the, the audience. Whenever you uh, speak to a, a, a journalist, uh, ask them uh, what they want. I mean, you are able to ask as many questions as possible uh, to make sure that you are de delivering high quality uh, content. So if, if, uh, if you're speaking to a journalist, ask them you know, who the audience is, how, what the angle is. Uh, you know, if you're speaking to a, a specialized publication, for example, the American Journal of Medicine, obviously you know, the, the language that you're gonna be using will be different. Um, from the language that you're going to be using 
when uh, speaking to a, a, you know, someone who runs a blog or, uh, or a general media uh, outlet. And uh, if we look at point three here, uh, this might sound quite funny, but unfortunately it is not. Um, when, when, I, uh, when I do uh, audiovisual media trainings, which, uh, which, uh, where we always have a camera, we always uh, initiate a sort of crisis. So we, uh, I always ask uh, you know, the, the participants to, to react to a, uh, to a crisis immediately, you know, literally five minutes after uh, they have uh, found out what the crisis was. And surprisingly, I've had a number of cases of people who said, you know what, I should actually be fired uh, for what I said, because I didn't mean to say that. So uh, there is, th there's three very important ideas that I want to share with you here. Talking points, talking points, and again, talking points know exactly what you want to say. Otherwise, you're gonna be swayed away. You're gonna be distracted. You're gonna, uh, you know, the, the, the question might not be uh, asked the same way that, it, you know, as it was asked initially before you start the recording, for instance. So definitely be prepared, prepared with your talking uh, points. And, and finally, uh, you know, if you do interviews, TV interviews or podcasts or, or radio interviews, uh, you know, be um, prepared to know uh, the conscious and uncontrolled behavior, your uncontrolled behavior. What I mean here is, and, and 